Good morning, Inspired Church. I want to say thank you so much for joining us and for being a part of the Inspired Church family. If you're a bit newer at Inspired Church and you have yet to fill out a connection card, would you fill out a connection card, head back to the guest center at your campus, and get your free gift today. We would love to get to know you a little bit more and help you get connected to your church family. Well, guys, we are getting ready for a powerful service. We believe God has great things in store for you, and I want to challenge you to get up on your feet right where you're at. Worship is not a spectator sport. It's something that we participate in. And here at Inspire Church, we believe in exalting God Almighty because he's worthy to be praised in worship. So stand up to your feet. Let's get ready to worship Jesus together. <laughs> Good morning, Inspire Church. How are you? Yep, that extra hour of sleep felt good. You ready to worship the Lord today? everybody. Uh, we are so excited to be here to worship together with each of you guys. If you are new with us, um, I just want to say welcome. You have found a great place to gather together as a family here this morning as we worship God together. Um, in the seat back in front of you, I just want to point this out real quick. If you are new with us, um, fill out this card with as much information as you feel uh, comfortable with. This is our connection card. On the back, um, there is a place for prayer requests and a few other things that you guys each can individually put on here because our, our staff 
praise each week for these. Um, if you are new with us, though, at the Guest Center, you can drop this card off at the end of service and get a free gift from us. We just want to say thank you for being here because we believe that being together in community is super important. And we're so thankful that you guys are all here this morning. And as we get together and worship this morning, guys, let's just welcome God's presence in here and bring a spirit of praise to this place. Guys, let's just pray right now and invite God into this place. And God, we just want to thank you, Father, that you are here and that, God, that you have already prepared this place. That, God, as we bring worship and praise to you this morning, God, we pray it would, God, it would just lift up the heavens this morning, God. We pray that as we empty our hearts out, God, that we would be filled with you and your Holy Spirit, God. Lord, we love you, God. We invite you into our hearts this morning, God. And we ask that, God, you would change us to be more like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We worship you, Jesus. How many of you are thankful for his love? That love that chases us down, right? That's a reason to worship him. It's just because of the gratitude flowing out of our heart. We worship him because of who he is, not because of what our circumstance says. Amen? Come on, sing this out. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. So, so good to me. Thank you, Jesus. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in. Yeah. You have been so, so
search the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise the treasures of faith are never enough come on do you believe that today when you came along thank you Jesus and put me back together Desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, Jesus. Nothing is better than you. Come on, raise your hand if you agree with that today. There is nothing better than Jesus. Amen. I'm not afraid. Come on, sing this with us today. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, but you see the more.
shout of praise in this place. He is worthy. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Let's just sing that one more time with hands raised today. Oh, there's nothing, Jesus, better than you, Lord. There's Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. I just feel like we need to lock that in one more time this morning. Jesus, nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Yes, Jesus, we love you today. Lord, we give you all the glory and the praise and the honor. And today, right now, in this moment, Jesus, we say that there is nothing in this world that is better than you. Lord, that there is nothing that comes close to you. That nothing and no one is worthy to be worshipped like you are our, our king. So, Jesus, we pray that you would move in this place. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just come to church just so that we can kind of hang out and have coffee. Lord, there's nothing wrong with those things. But, Lord, I pray that we would be the church, that when we walk out of this room, God, that your light will shine forth in the darkness, that when we walk into this place, we would be ready to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. I pray for an increase of passion, Lord, in our people. Lord, that you would create in us, God, a will and a power and a strength to say, I don't know what everybody else is doing, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God, I pray that you would embolden us, God. Give us passion for you again. And, Lord, we love you today. We bless you today. We honor you today for you are the name above all names and we truly believe what we're singing. God, that there is nothing that is better than you. So Lord, have your way today and do what only you can do in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. If you're in agreement, just shout out amen this morning. Amen, amen. amen. Come on, let's hear it for Jesus today. He is good. Amen. Amen. How many love Jesus? Raise your hand. How many of you did not get more sleep last night? Raise your other hand. I don't know how that works. It always feels, uh, it's, it's something, the government's up to something. No, I'm totally kidding. No, no, it, it never feels like you get more rest on that kind of a night, does it? But that's okay because you're in the house of peace and rest because our God is a God of peace and rest. Amen? Amen. You can have a seat this morning. We have a lot of great things going on at Inspire Church. I want to mention one more time, if you're a guest of ours, we are so thankful that you're here. We want you to take a moment during the service grab a connection card that's in the seat back pocket around you, fill it out, and take it back to our guest center at the end of service. We have a special gift for you, and we want to help you get connected to Jesus and connected to a good, healthy church family, of which I'm biased, but I believe we are today. So again, thank you so much for being here. we got a lot of great things going on for you and for all the families in our church. Let's check out this video together. We're so thankful to have you here at Inspire Church today. Let's see what we have coming up. Listen, men, you don't want to have egg on your face, so come to Men's Breakfast, November 11th, 8 a.m., Sidrowilly Campus. It's going to be an excellent time. I'll see you there. Hey, Inspire, I would love to have you join me every Wednesday at our Sidrowilly Campus at 7 p.m. for our Inspire Church Family Nights. We have groups and classes for all ages from birth to adult. So bring the family, invite a friend, and I will see you on Wednesdays. Good morning, season saints. We're looking forward to November 17th, our next luncheon, but we're gonna have a little change. We're going to meet at Bob's Burgers. Order what you want, everybody buys their own lunch. We're still gonna have the same good fellowship. Uh, don't worry about the seconds I have. I've tipped the cameraman 50 cents, so I get some time to tell you an important thing. We're gonna November 12th is Orphan Sunday here at Inspire Church. We're gonna be joined by Matt from Open Arms International in Kenya to be hearing some of the awesome stuff that God is doing through the orphanage in Kenya. And as a part of that day, we're gonna be having an informational meeting for our upcoming missions trip that's gonna be happening. We're gonna be going to the orphanage in Kenya in 2024. So if you want some more information about that, make sure you're there November 12th. Hey, Inspire Church. If you're volunteering at Inspire Church at any location, Josh and I would personally 
definitely like to invite you out to our volunteer dinner, November 17th at 6.30 p.m. Register online today. Do you want to dig deeper into the end time studies? Well, Pastor Josh is going to be leading a study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock where we will have a Q&A session and we will look forward to seeing you there. Hey, Inspire Church, we have Grief Share every Monday night at 5 p.m. at our Cedar Woolley campus. If you are interested, head to icskagitvalley.org for more information or to sign up. Hey, Inspire Church, want to let you know about Operation Christmas Child that is coming up. We will have boxes available at every location starting November 5th, and those shoe boxes will be due on November 19th. So don't miss out on this opportunity to pack a shoe box, make a difference in a kid's life this year, and we want to say thank you for being a part as we are also now an official drop-off location for Operation Christmas Child. If you want to get involved with any of this, please sign up today at your campus. Also, we have our Inspire Thanksgiving Outreach coming up the week of Thanksgiving. We're going to be providing a hot meal, food boxes, haircuts, clothing, and so many other things to the community at our Burlington campus the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So get connected, sign up, get registered to volunteer today, and invite some people out for that great Thanksgiving outreach. We'll see you soon. When you pack shoebox gifts with Operation Christmas Child, you're sending joy and blessing children all over the world. Through your simple act of kindness, children experience the love of Jesus, are discipled through the local church, and are empowered to reach their families and communities with the good news of Jesus Christ. To send joy to children all over the world, visit SamaritansPurse.org OCC. For more information, check us out on social media or icskagitvalley.org. See you real soon. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? How many of you guys were at our trunk or treat on Tuesday night? Well, I get the privilege of talking about that a little bit. We had an amazing turnout. I know that we had hundreds of kids. We had brand new families to our community that actually came, found out about our church because of this event, which crazy, right? We're going we're gonna to talk about a, a, an event of Halloween, and then we p- have people coming to church, finding a local place where they can find community. That's a beautiful thing. But we have some amazing announcements that we're going to talk about right now, because everybody did it, that did a trunk or treat, we actually had judges there. So we have some winners that we want to recognize. So I want you guys to kind of give them a little bit of a round of applause as we go through this list. But right now, I have an honorable mention, which was Baby Shark and the Day Family. They got honorable mention. That's an amazing. Our runner-up was the Toy Story by the Radaba family. If I said that wrong, you get free coffee on me because I am so sorry. I tried many times. Our winners, though, we had two winners, actually, because we had a tie. This is tough. You know how it is when you have, like, two children, and you're like, you know, which one's better? And you're like, ah, they're both the winners. Well, this happened here. Um, we have, the, for the, so for the tie, we had the Grinch, which was the Rendall's. Can I have that one up? There you go. Not that they don't have a creative bone in their body, but they did a great job. Um, And then the baby calf in a box truck by the Skagit River Ranch. So these are our two winners. Um, You guys can go to the, uh, uh, contact the office this week. We have a gift card for you from Oliver Hammer. We want to give that to you guys. So please, this week, contact them, and we will get that to you. Well, one of the great things about doing the, uh, the fall event that we do is that we've been so consistent. That's why we see success. It isn't because we have big production or we have a big, consi- but it's consistency. And guys, as we talk about giving this morning, there's a characteristic that God talks about all the time. And I think we overlook it, not only in our church, but I think in the world, it's an overlooked characteristic. And I want to highlight it through Luke 16:10. It says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest with very little is also dishonest with much. And we look at this verse sometimes and we think about getting the more. How do we get to the more? I got to be faithful, so I'll get the more. We're always looking for the end result. But Jesus is talking about one characteristic, and it's faithfulness. Faithfulness is what God looks for. How many of you here have a spouse or has friends? What is the one characteristic that you want them to have that you probably never say? I want somebody who's faithful. I want somebody who's going to show up, somebody who's going to be consistent. And that's what Jesus wants from each of us. This world, unfortunately, has big, bold, and beautiful. Like, we want somebody that's really talented in this, but maybe they're really bad at home. Maybe they're really good at this, but they're not great at this. But God wants consistency and faithfulness from us. He's not asking for us to show up big every day. He's asking for us to be faithful. And I love that about him. And as we talk about faithfulness, I think that often we see Jesus talks about faithfulness with money and our wealth. 
Even so much to say that our faithfulness and how we handle money determines the posture of our hearts towards one another. I want to encourage you today to remain faithful with the giving of your finances and keeping an open-handed position. Do we hold our money like this or do we hold it like this with God? Not because God needs your money, but rather because he wants to ensure our hearts remain what? Soft. So each of us, if you feel that your heart has been hard towards God in some way, check this area of your life to see if you are soft towards God. This area often can be the doorway to God softening your heart and doing amazing things, not just in your finances, but in your heart, which I think matters more to him and to me than anything else. Guys, as we give, let's be faithful. There's many ways that you can give with us here at Inspire Church. You can text 84321 and text any dollar amount, and it will go directly to the church. Or you can use one of our giving envelopes in the back. There's black boxes throughout the sanctuary that you can drop those off with at the end of service. Or you can go to icskagetvalley.org and click giving right at the top. And, you, and that's how I do it. I set it up to automatically give so that I don't even have to think about it. I budget it. It goes in consistently. It's just a great way to do it. And also, you can mail a check to us here at 805 Township Street, Cedar Woolley, Washington. Will you guys join me in praying for the offering this morning? God, we just thank you that, God, you are faithful to us. You've been the example of faithfulness. And, God, as we live our lives, I pray that, Lord, we would each hold this characteristic in high regard, that we would be faithful with what you've given to us, God. God, we thank you for those that are faithful in this church. We ask that, God, you would bless them, that you would continue to move in their lives. And, God, I pray for those of us maybe who have struggled in that area. God, I pray that you would just help us to just as a little bit by little bit, that, God, we would give more of ourselves to you, God, so that we can show that we are faithful with what you've given us. God, we ask that you would bless this Skagit Valley because of what you are giving and doing in this church, Lord. We love you, and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you guys watch this video here with us? Three, two, one. When that shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoeboxes. They are so happy. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about his son, Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled, and we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes, thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. Well, good morning, Inspire Church. You could probably tell that we're a little bit excited about shoe boxes around here today. Uh, I want to challenge you that this season, this year, that we need to be generous and that we need to kind of get out of our own thinking. How many of you know that the economy's been a little tighter this year? Things have been a little more interesting. I think that's a wonderful time for us to say, you know what, Jesus, I want to give more to you, not less. And so a shoebox is a very easy, simple way to do that with your family, to teach your kids about being generous. So friends, I want to encourage you to pack a shoebox this year as we want, to, we want to send even more than we did last year. Last year, I think we sent over 500. Wouldn't it be cool if we did closer to 800 or even 1,000 this year? That would be pretty awesome to do. So I want to challenge you, pack a shoebox. Nicole and I typically pack a shoebox for every kid that we have. Pastor Ryan packs a shoebox or two for every cat that he has. So it is what it is, whatever you want to do to make a difference. We would love for you today. You can grab a shoebox on the way out at your campus today. And with that, I want to welcome those that are watching online this morning. Can we go crazy for them? Hey, listen. If you're watching online today, it's Time Change Sunday. You should have been here. I'm just throwing that out there. It's okay, though. We love you. We're so glad you're watching online with us. And can we hear it for our campuses this morning, LaConnor Campus? Can we go crazy for LaConnor this morning? It is great to be a, a part of a multi-site church along with LaConnor and Marble Mount and even Burlington. And lastly, this morning, you may or may not know this, it is Pastor Ryan's birthday, our, our Burlington campus pastor. So Pastor Ryan, I know you're watching this morning from Burlington. Can we just go crazy for him and say happy birthday all around the place? It's a good thing. So... I just joked with Ryan that we're going to keep finding a reason to celebrate him every single Sunday until Jesus comes back. So really excited about that. Well, with that, 
why don't we go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump into God's word this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, just to be here together, to come together, to hear from you, to, to, to break open your word together, God, to be, to be challenged by you, and then after church, God, to be used by you in a pow powerful way. Lord, I pray that you would move me out of the way, that you would speak your word to your people, God, and thank you, Lord, again, for every single person that finds themselves here or watching online or watching at another campus today. We're so thankful for each and every one. God, have your way today in Jesus' mighty name. If you're in agreement, just shout out amen this morning. You know, we are in a series called It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine. And I, and I want to challenge you with something that last week we talked about how do we know that we're living in the end times. If you missed that message, I strongly encourage you to go back and watch it so that this one can make a little bit more sense. But now, this week, we're going to be talking about what is next. And I want to mention this to you, that as we look at eschatology or the study of end times, I want to say this loudly and clearly. I could be wrong. Usually I don't say that very much because usually as we're preaching God's word, it's a very simple understanding. It's very black and white. But with the study of end times, there's a lot of opinions and different viewpoints on things. So I want to mention to you today that maybe I'm not right about every single thing that I'm talking about. Somebody say amen. But you need to reconcile this in your heart that Jesus is coming and he's coming soon and are you ready? That is the point of this entire series is for us to be ready. And how many of you know for many, many years people have been talking about the end of the world? As a matter of fact, since the year 2000 alone, there's been at least 120 big budget Hollywood films whose main theme had to do with the end of the world. What's interesting about that is from 1970 to 1999, there were only 100 movies total made in that, in that category. And before that, the number gets less and less and less. The reason why I'm saying this to you is all of a sudden, we're very, very interested in the end of the world. Even people who are not followers of Jesus are ready for what is to come next, or they think they're ready. I don't think they are. But even churches and pastors have tried to claim that they know exactly when the end will be, which is just stupid, by the way. And if you're ever attending a church or watching something online and they tell you it's time to sell your house and donate all the money to their ministry, please leave that ministry and no longer pay attention to what they're doing. Everybody with me today? But why is it that everyone is so interested in the world coming to, the, to an end all of a sudden? Well, I believe personally that there is a, an inherent knowledge in every single human being that the end is drawing near. And although no one could ever know the exact day or hour or even year, we can definitely know the season that we're in. See, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 4, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Listen, what Paul the Apostle is saying here is that we as believers should not be surprised that the world will be surprised. And how many of you would agree with me with an amen this morning that you sense that Jesus is coming soon? Anybody with me today? Now, soon could mean one minute, one day, one year, or a thousand years. We're not sure because God is not bound by time and space, so he's not worried about these things like we are. But it certainly seems like we are in that season of the last days. Jesus said this about the second coming and even the rapture in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 to 44. He says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Now remember, Jesus is on earth at this time, 100% man, 100% God, but living as a human being on the earth. And he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Did you hear that, therefore? I love the word therefore because it reminds us that we need to see why on earth it's therefore. You guys with me today? He says, keep watch. Somebody say, keep watch. 
because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Listen, last week we talked about where we are on the doomsday clock, so to speak. Today, we're going to share about where we are going. See, we know from prophecy, science, history, and other evidences, and even common sense that we are truly living in the end times. Again, if you want more resource with that, please watch the sermon from last Sunday. We believe that nothing else needs or has to happen before the rapture happens. Things can happen and might even happen before the rapture, but nothing has to happen. In other words, that event can happen at any time. So today on your way in, you were probably handed a bulletin this morning, and I I want you to get that out today. There's notes inside of there. It's very important today. Usually I don't really say that, but we are talking about a lot of obscure things in Scripture today, and I don't want to leave you hanging. As a matter of fact, I want to say a couple things to you. If you are newer to Inspire Church, what we are talking about today, I've only talked about twice. This is the second time in five years of being the pastor here, because honestly, it's important, but it's not the most important thing. Are you with me today? And so if you don't like today or you're like, man, they're weird or that pastor's a little creepy, give me a couple weeks before you give me the creepy title. I promise I'm not as creepy as today may seem. The second thing, as I mentioned, we could not be completely right about all of these things. As a matter of fact, last week I mentioned that and I even said, hey, if you have a bunch of opinions about the end times, you don't have to send them all to me. I get it. I've heard it. I've seen it. I've read it. We've been looking at this for many, many, many years. And right after one of the services last week, this woman comes up to me and she says, pastor, I want you to know that I don't believe in the rapture. And I said, thank you for letting me know that. That is great. I, 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 don't, do, I said, do you believe in the second coming of Jesus? She said, yes. I said, well, good. Then we're good. We're all good. Everything's all good. And my point of that is, is you may have your opinions. And some people that you listen to may have their opinions. And you may be watching YouTube or TikTok preachers, and they may have their opinions. I'm more interested in the opinion of the Word of God, but I still want to share with you that today we are sharing some denominational opinion. So make sure that you look into Scripture and decide for yourself what you believe and why you believe that. But I want to answer five key end times questions today. So if we can, we're going to jump into this. And the first question is, what is the rapture? We've all heard that term, and as a matter of fact, many pastors have said, you better get ready for the rapture. And then when we're kids, we're like, I don't know what that means. And then people try to explain it to us, and sometimes it even gets more confusing. So I want to give you a definition of rapture. And the word rapture comes from the Latin word raptu, which means caught away or to be caught up. Somebody say caught up or even snatched away. The Latin word is equivalent to the Greek word harpazo or harpazo, which is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, that says they will be caught up or snatched away on that day. I love when people say, well, I don't believe in the rapture because the word rapture is actually never found in Scripture. As a matter of fact, yes, a Latin word would not be found in a Greek text. That is true. But the word harpezo, to be caught up or snatched away, is definitely found. And there's teaching about the rapture that I want to talk with you about today. Much like the word trinity is never actually used in scripture, the word rapture is also never actually used in the Bible, even though the theme of the rapture is definitely seen. And can I tell you, the theme of the trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is definitely seen. And it's a very sound doctrine. Are you with me today? So let's talk a little bit more about the rapture. We just defined what that word means and what it actually represents, but what really is it? The Bible refers to it, I believe, as the blessed hope. Somebody say blessed hope. And the blessed hope is really twofold. It is this idea that one day we will either die or Jesus will come back for us and take us into the clouds, and either way, we will be with him for all of eternity. That is why it is referred to as the blessed hope, because, friends, it is a blessed hope. Are you with me today? Titus chapter 2.13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, even in the first century church, they were waiting for this event. They were waiting for Jesus to come and take his bride to be with him for all of eternity. Second question we want to answer today is what will the rapture be like? Somebody say crazy. Not for us, we're just going home, but for everybody else it will be interesting. Number one, Christians will be caught up. 
Now, I, I always love the idea of these rapture movies that try to portray this in a way that's biblical but also entertaining. And my favorite version is, as a matter of fact, when they take all of the clothes that everybody's wearing and they fold them up nicely and neatly and there's never any undergarments to be found anywhere. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with these Christian people going out? Doesn't, didn't your mom ever tell you better change your pants in case you get in an accident? You guys with me today? And I always remember seeing that thing. Something is wrong. But the reality is, is I don't think we're going to be worried about clothes or exactly how that happens, friends, what we're going to notice is that we are caught up to be with him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 is a prophetic passage that has to do with the blessed hope, the rapture. Brothers and sisters, Paul writes, we do not want you to be uninformed, somebody say ignorant, that's another word for that, about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up, there's that word, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I want to say that last part again. Encourage one another with these words. Friends, if you've lost a loved one and they're a believer in Jesus, they are in his presence right now. And one day God will unite body, soul, and spirit again at the coming of the Lord. And friends, the dead in Christ shall rise first. I want you to know that we don't have to worry or be concerned or be afraid, friends, because one day we will no longer be caught up with the things of this world. We will be caught up in the rapture. Are you with me today? Second thing about this idea, what will the rapture be like, is it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. Now, you may not know this, but the twinkling of an eye is just about the fastest method of measuring time that we can think of. It's literally quicker than a snap. The twinkling of an eye would be the fastest measurement of human time that they could have thought of, especially in the first century. It may be a millisecond of a millisecond. I'm not really smart that way, so I'll leave it to you to Google and figure out later. But the twinkling of an eye is very, very fast. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52, Paul writes, listen, I tell you a mystery. Remember, friends, God sometimes is, has mysteries about him, but he's not mysterious. But there's things that he does that are a mystery to us because we don't understand. He says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Listen, I'm excited about this change. Anybody else? You know, the other day I was playing basketball and my legs were hurting so bad that I could hardly run. And I was thinking... I am ready for this rapture to happen right now, Lord. As a matter of fact, do it while I have the ball in my hand so I could look down and just go, there it is. The ball is still dribbling and I'm not there. That would be pretty sweet. It didn't happen, but it may happen one of these days. But here's the thing. People always ask, well, pastor, what will our bodies be like? What will that be like? Well, we're not given a ton of information because honestly, it doesn't really matter. It matters who we're with, not how we are. And we will be with Jesus. But from what we can tell, we will probably be similar to be like that of Christ's resurrected body. You could recognize Christ. He had the holes were still there. He told Thomas, come and touch him. And something really, really, really cool about Jesus after the resurrection, it seems to me like maybe he can walk through walls and stuff. Because he just showed up. Thomas said, I won't believe it until I see it. And Jesus just said, poof, Thomas, what's up? I'm right here. And I just love that. And so I just imagine that that's maybe how it's going to be. But the reality is, is we don't know. But it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. Number three, it will be devastating to those left behind. Now I want you to hear, Christian believer, we do not have to be afraid of what is to come. We do not have to fear what is to come. As long as you have a healthy reverence and fear of the Lord and you're following Jesus, you are good to go. But for those who don't, it will be devastating. Imagine for just a moment losing your spouse or your children or everyone you care about to a worldwide phenomenon where millions of people vanish off the face of the earth. Luke 17, 34 to 35 says, I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Which, by the way, if you want to know 
That scripture has an inerrancy to it. If you want to know that Jesus is truly God, listen to what he says in Luke 17. In a time period where it wasn't understood that on the other side of the world it can be nighttime while it's daytime, Jesus gives this prophetic voice and he says, someone will be sleeping and the person next to them will be taken and they will be left. At the same time, someone will be grinding grain. Nobody ever ground grain during the nighttime. So Jesus was saying that he understood and knew the way that he created the earth to be. So it's just one of those interesting things as we look at prophecy that Jesus was smarter than anybody else alive at that time because he knew the way that the world worked. And he says that in this prophetic statement. So what will the rapture be like? It's going to be fun for us, devastating for those that are left behind. Let's answer another end times question. When will the rapture happen? Let me tell you, if you think you know, do not write a book. If you think you know, please don't give a prophetic statement because it would be unbiblical for you to know the exact day and the hour because only God knows. Only God knows. Somebody say that loud in the back. Only God knows. I love it when people say, Pastor, this is what's going to happen. Matthew 24, 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows except for this random person who lives in the high desert of California. I'll tell you, I I had people tell me, Pastor, this is what's going to happen. I'm like, man, that's interesting because not even the son knew while he was on earth. That's crazy that you have a one-line direction with God that way. It's crazy because it's not true. Anybody with me today? Only the Father knows. Only God knows when it's going to happen. The second answer to that question is that we believe in the imminent return of Christ. I mentioned this yesterday, that this could happen at any time. Luke chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus says, You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Friends, we need to be ready. It would seem to me like someone who's a believer in Jesus will kind of know the season and the time. But maybe I wonder if Jesus is speaking to the idea that Christians will get a bit lazy in their faith and he will come in that kind of time. That when you least expect him, can I tell you, if the church of Jesus in America specifically today thought that Jesus was coming back today, we would be more excited about that. We would be more intentional about our life. We would be more on fire for Christ. We would be preaching the gospel to our friends, but instead we're a little bit busy. We're a little bit consumed with the things of this world, and yet it can happen at any time. And here's where you may disagree with my belief, and I'm okay with that. So the next answer to this third question, and again, we're answering the question, when will the rapture happen? I personally believe, and our church certainly teaches, that we believe in a pre-wrath rapture. Pre-wrath. How many of you are familiar with the term pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, and post-tribulation rapture? Raise your hand. How many of you are confused by what I just said? I'm so glad you're here today because we're going to talk about this. There is an idea that to me is very clearly taught in Scripture that something is coming called the tribulation period. And there is a thought process by some that the Christians will not get taken before that, but after that or even in the middle of that. And I've concluded, and again, I love saying that I could be wrong because, well, I could be. And I love saying that you could be wrong because, well, you could be, right? And I love saying that your crazy uncle who's a prophetic genius, could be wrong because, well, he could be. Thank you. You guys are catching on. I I love that. In Burlington, some of you may be wrong. (gasps) You you could be. I'm just saying that all of us could be a little bit wrong, but I want to teach you our perspective of the pre-wrath rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, it says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, That is a prophetic passage that Paul is speaking to this idea and says that we have not been appointed to suffer wrath. Now, one passage that can be taken out of context would not be quite enough for me to build a theology around. So let's keep working this out together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10 says, They tell you how, or they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Again, in context, that's a prophetic statement, and the coming wrath would be the tribulation, which I'll explain in just a couple moments. In the book of Daniel, which is a very prophetic book, and most of us, when we read the book of Daniel, we read it as a historical narrative, but over half of the book of Daniel is actually geared towards future prophecy. 
And in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Daniel is receiving a download, so to speak, from God, a prophetic statement. And it says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Talking about Michael the archangel, for those of you that wouldn't be familiar with that, that God has angels that fight on our behalf and war for us. It says, there will be a time of distress. Such has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that, t- at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So there's all these statements, and I'm going to keep talking to you for a moment. Here's the thing, though. It's Sunday morning at Inspired Church, and you might be brand new to Inspired Church. I promise you I'm not as weird as I sound right now. I promise. But these are things that the Bible teaches us, and it's so important that we address them. But if you want to dig deeper, you have questions, please join me on Wednesday night this week at 7 p.m. I'm going to be breaking down the prophecies of Daniel and talking about where we get this belief from and why. And if you have questions, it's a great time for you to come on out. I also want to say why I believe personally, and I'm telling you I personally believe, in a pre-wrath rapture. I don't care very much if it's pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation. Somebody say, I know I may not be supposed to say that this morning. I'm not sure board members are taking notes right now. That's okay. But here's the thing is I just like to believe what the Bible says, not what someone tells me to believe necessarily or what a denomination says that we have to believe. You with me today? And I see biblical evidence, in my opinion, for a pre-wrath rapture. In other words, before things go from bad to worse, I believe God will come and rescue his church from those things. And I believe that if our name is found written in the Lamb's book of life, that we will be caught up in that moment. And friends, I believe that because there's a biblical and historical model that shows God rescuing his people regularly. Think of Noah. Jesus gave us a clue and said, it will be like the days of Noah where the world is going about their business and Noah stepped into the ark and then the flood came. God rescued Noah from the judgment that was coming because the tribulation is judgment. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Think about Isaac being rescued from being sacrificed. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah that God found a remnant, one family that was worth rescuing and he saved them. Think about the Israelite slaves in Egypt that were rescued from the angel of death that came upon them. There are example after example after example of God rescuing his people before great judgment happens, which is why I personally believe that. Now, let me let you in on a secret. If you disagree with me, we can still go to church together. Amen? As a matter of fact, you can disagree with me on all kinds of things, and we can still go to church together. There are things that are salvation issues and non-salvation issues. This is not a salvation issue. You guys with me today? So in my opinion, then, what will happen after the rapture? Well, I'm glad that you didn't ask, but I asked for you. Here we go. What will happen after the rapture? The answer is the tribulation or the great tribulation. Somebody say the tribulation. And I want to tell you a little bit about the tribulation. The Bible says it's a seven-year period of time. And I believe it's the 70th week of Daniel that was prophesied in the book of Daniel. And I'll explain more of that on Wednesday night. I don't have time to get into it this morning. But here's some things about the tribulation. It will be worldwide as the fill-in on number one. It will be worldwide. In other words, it's not only going to be something that just happens in one part of the world like Israel. It is going to be in every part of the world. It's going to be completely worldwide according to Revelation 3 verse 10. Number two, it will be the worst time of affliction ever in human history. I want you to let that soak in. If we think times are bad now, if we think that times have been bad in our lifetime, this will be the worst time of affliction ever in human history. Number three, the Antichrist and the false prophet will come into power. The Antichrist and the false prophet will come into power, and we put On your notes today, the scriptural references so that you can look that up and see for yourself so that you know I'm just sharing with you what the Bible says today. This person, the Antichrist, will lead a one-world government and a global currency. You know what's interesting to me is about 75 years ago, it wasn't even possible to have a one-world government or global currency. And now not only is it possible, but I would say it's plausible. And we're seeing some of those things happen. And it's not a conspiracy theory tinfoil hat thing because can I tell you not everything you read on the Internet is true. I don't know if you knew that or not. (laughs) And TikTok theology and and YouTube theology is bad, unless you're watching Inspired Church on YouTube this morning, in which case uh, this is a church service at a real regular church in a real regular community in which we're just proclaiming the gospel. But why am I saying this, friends? Because these things are written about. 
And whatever you believe about the rapture doesn't matter as much to me as the tribulation is one of those things that's very clearly taught about in Scripture, very clearly spoken of, that we are coming up on a time of human history that will be the worst time of affliction ever, that the Antichrist will raise up a one-world government and a one-world currency. And number four, there will be a mark of the beast, and that number is 666. We don't talk about this a lot in churches these days. But the interesting thing is, is in my opinion, this is such a futuristic statement that is made in Scripture, in Revelation 13 specifically, that it could not have even happened necessarily before now. Because buying and selling will require this mark. Buying and selling will require this mark. We don't know exactly what it is. Listen, your Uncle Bob will send you an article every other week. This is it. We don't know. But the reality is, is it could be something that's a bit unorthodox. It could be a, a computer chip or something else. But what really matters is, is that when we see a time in our lifetimes, if we see it, where you are required to wear a mark or to have a computer chip or do something else and worship a false Messiah, we need to be aware that Jesus is coming soon and we better make sure that we don't take that mark. You guys with me today? The only way to escape this mark is to hide or to have your head chopped off. And it is mentioned that specifically. So we need to be aware that whatever your theology is, if we start seeing these things come into play, throw your theology out the window and follow what the Bible says. Amen? That's very important. Number five, Jews and Gentiles who believe in Christ will be saved. So there is still hope for those that get left behind. But let me tell you, getting saved in the tribulation should not be your fire insurance. If you're not accepting Jesus now when it's easier to do, I can almost assure you you will not accept him when it's harder to do. And if you're waiting for proof or evidence or those things, we have enough proof and evidence as of today. If you're not believing in Jesus, it's because your heart doesn't want to. And I would encourage you to get right with Jesus even today. Amen. Let me talk to you for just a moment briefly about the tribulation. And I'm going to close with this. Erica, you can come up because we got three services and we got to zoom through. You ready? So I'm going to give you a bunch of weird things right now because this is the only time as your pastor that I ever get to talk with you about this idea. So I want to walk with you through a traditional understanding of what the tribulation will be like. Again, the tribulation is the literal last seven years of human history as we know it. And I believe that we have not hit that period of history yet, although it could start at any time. Anybody with me today? I believe that it is the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks, which is found in Daniel chapter 9. If you have any more curiosity about that, come out on Wednesday. But let me, let me tell you a little bit about this. The tribulation, it would seem, starts with the rapture of the church. Although, again, we could be wrong. Anybody with me today? It's good to keep saying that. The Jewish temple is built. And listen, this we're not wrong about. And this can happen after the rapture. And by the way, it's interesting that for the first time really that I'm aware of in the last 15 or so years, every furniture item and everything needed for a fully functioning temple on the Temple Mount in Israel is already built sitting in warehouses, and they are ready to build this temple. They can't because the holy land there is contested between multiple religions, and to start to build this would literally cause World War III. But here's the thing. In the tribulation, there will be a Jewish temple built again. And it could happen either before or after the rapture because of how quickly we can build things today. The Antichrist rises to power very rapidly. He makes some kind of treaty bringing a false peace to the world. And it's a seven-year peace treaty that will eventually fail. Friends, I don't know about you, but these things are interesting because if you were to tell me right now that we can live in peace around the world, most of us would sign up for that and think it's a good thing. But the enemy always comes as a deceiver, as an angel of light, trying to do what seems good, but he's not doing something that is good. Are you with me today? And in some ways, we're already seeing the spirit behind the Antichrist moving in this world today. And the word anti doesn't necessarily mean against, it means in place of or instead of. And we're seeing that spirit rise up around the world in ways that we've never seen before. This Antichrist leads some type of new world order, one world government and global currency. The Antichrist and the false prophet use the power of Satan to perform many false wonders and miracles, which causes the earth to worship the Antichrist and believe that he was the one to come. 
Again, as I mentioned, a mark is required for any and all purchases and travel. This may or may not be a mark or a chip. We don't know. We just know that there is a mark of the beast that is required. Anyone who will not take that mark will have to hide or be killed. Their heads will be chopped off. You may not know this, but more Christians in the last 50 years have had their heads chopped off than at any other time in all of human history. It's almost as if we're preparing for this. At some point, the Christians will be rounded up and martyred if they don't take the mark. They will be hunted and hated because of the name of Jesus. And then at some point, the Antichrist will cease sacrifices in the newly constructed temple. And he does something that is called the abomination that causes desolation, which basically means that he makes a sacrifice in the temple of God, most likely of a pig. Friends, can I tell you, you might be like, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. That's okay. Come on Wednesday. I'd love to help you understand a little bit more about what is coming. But more importantly than what is coming is where are you today? Are you ready to go home and be with Jesus? Because we can breathe our very last in this room today. We can be raptured in this moment right now. We can be facing Jesus any moment. Are we ready for that? So let me answer one last question today. What will end the great tribulation? We believe here at our church that the second coming of Christ will end the great tribulation. Some people believe that the rapture and the second coming of Christ is, a, is an event that happens at the same time. Can I tell you, you're allowed to believe that and still attend Inspire Church. I don't care. But you must believe in the second coming of Christ if you are a believer in Jesus. Because he is coming. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. I want to read you this. And I want to remind you that you may not have understanding of all the crazy things that we're talking about in this series. That's okay. But I want you to have an understanding that we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that he is coming back for us. And whatever you believe surrounding the events of Jesus' return, just know that he is coming back for us. And Revelation 19, 11 to 16 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. I want you to know this is speaking about Jesus Christ right here. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, meaning they were righteous and perfect behind him. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He leads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hey, listen, I just want to say if you're a tattoo hater, it's written on his thigh. I'm not making a case for tattoos. I'm just saying something to think about today, all right? Written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I close with this, are you ready today? Are you ready today? One of the things that I most often think about is this idea that Jesus is coming back for me and he's coming soon. And this idea that we just read, that his eyes are like blazing fire. And I think of that as a pastor, as I'm responsible to God for many of you. And I think about the idea that one day I'm going to have to look those blazing eyes in the eye and I'm going to have to give an account for my life and so will you. Now I thank God for the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. That means that Jesus sees me through the sacrifice that he made in place of me because of me and for me. And that he paid for my sin as he was a substitution on the cross for me. And that because he is raised from the dead, that he broke the power of sin and death and hell over our lives. And one day we will be with him. And make no mistake, he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the earth, to suffer the, the vengeance and wrath of God on the cross. When he returns, he is wielding the wrath and vengeance of God as the Lion of Judah. And he will return as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will establish his kingdom. Church, are you ready for that today? Because he's coming whether you're ready or not. He's coming whether you like it or not. He's coming whether you think he's coming or not. And one day the whole world will look upon him and recognize that they were wrong. 
I like to ask this question. And it's a very important, serious question. What will you do with Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah? It doesn't matter what you do with your belief of the rapture or when it is or how it'll be or how you think your clothes will or won't be folded up. What matters is what will you do with this sacrifice that Jesus made? What will you do with the vengeance of God if you have to stand before him all alone? We don't talk that much about the judgment of God, but can I tell you the gospel is called the good news. We can only receive good news if there's also bad news. The bad news is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, you need eternal life and so do I. You might be thinking today you don't need Jesus' help to make it in your life. You need the help of Jesus to go to Walmart. I went to Walmart yesterday. I needed his help with my children and other people. I needed Jesus' help. You need Jesus in your life. And what will you do with the sacrifice that he's made for you? Friends, would you pray with me today? Lord Jesus, I pray that, Lord, as we've just covered so much, I'll use the word obscure theology, Lord, things that we don't think about all the time and things that might even be confusing or even scary to us. Jesus, thank you that, Lord, we don't have to be afraid of you because you came and paid the price so that we can be with you, that we can be on the right side of history, that we can be on the right team. Not because we deserved it, Lord, or because anything about us made it to where you owed us anything, but Lord, because you and your grace and mercy called us and chose us. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the way that you care for us. And Jesus, we just declare together today, Lord, whether we agree or disagree in the room about how and when and, and, and all the facts and details of the rapture and even the tribulation, today, Jesus, we do declare that we do know that as you have said, you are coming again, and we believe that you are coming again, and we want to say that we are ready for you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be on the altar. Lord, this sermon series is not so that we can gain more information so that we could be a certified super Christian arguing with other people about the facts of what is happening and what is to come. But Lord, so that we can be a little bit more informed so that our hearts can be more quickened than they've ever been. Jesus, the study of end times, you know, Lord. The reason why I believe you included this in, in your Bible and your word, Lord, was for our hearts to be on the altar. Lord, I pray that today we would receive that conviction and that spirit of repentance would take over this place today. Lord, that we would realize that all of us have gone astray and all of us need you and need your help today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, friends, if you want to begin a relationship with Jesus today or you want to give your heart and life to him today, I want to just ask that you would think about this, that he loves you, that he has a plan for you, that he died in place of you and honestly because of your sin and that he wants to have a personal relationship with you. The Bible says that you and I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the cost of that sin is death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Christ Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, that we shall be saved. You don't have to have all the end time events figured out today. All you need to figure out is are you ready to follow Jesus? And for those of you that are believers in this room, I think all we need to figure out is that we would put Jesus first, that we would stop living in comfortable quarters with the world, that we would separate ourselves and come out from among them the way that the scripture teaches us. Friends, I wanna challenge you today to make your life all about Jesus. But before we do two things, Maybe you're a believer in Jesus today and maybe something that was said or spoken about today invokes a response of repentance in you. I want to challenge you and I even want to as your pastor and as your friend call you out even if you're dealing with pride and say today is the day to deal with those things. If you have a spirit of repentance today and you want to repent before the Father with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me because I'm raising my hand with you today. I want to make sure that I'm ready. 
I would say I live for Jesus every day of my life, but I also know that there's things that I need to give to him and there's things that I need to move on from and there's thoughts that I have sometimes that I need to make sure are in submission to him and I want to be the first one to repent here today. And second thing, maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you've fallen away from him. In a moment, we're going to pray all together. But if you want to make sure that that's right and that you're ready, whether it be for the rapture or whether it be for your passing or whatever it is, if you want to make sure, friends, that you are good with God, the only way to do that is through Jesus. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So if that's you and you want to accept Jesus, I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you. But I do want you to make it plain to yourself and to the Lord that you are making this decision today. So would you just throw up your hand nice and high so that God can see that today. Thank you. I see several hands in the room. Is there anybody else say, Pastor, would you pray for me today? About five or six that I see in the room saying, Pastor, would you pray for me today? Seven. Is there anybody else say, Pastor, would you pray for me today? Awesome. If you're on another campus this morning, I want you to know that God sees you, he sees your heart, and he cares for you deeply today. I have eight or nine in our room here today that are saying yes to Jesus. Bless you, thank you. It's the greatest decision that you could ever make. Why don't we repeat this prayer after me, nice and loudly inspire church at every location today. Can we just say this? Just say, dear Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. I believe that you are the son of God, that you died for me, and rose again. I ask you to come into my heart, to come into my life, and be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, I repent, Lord, for all of my sins, the things that I do and hold back from you, the things that I say, the attitudes of my heart. Help me, Jesus, to live for you and to be ready for your return. In Jesus' name. If you're in agreement, shout out amen this morning. Amen. Come on, can we hear it for Jesus today? He is good. Amen. Amen. You know, I want to mention again that if you're a first-time guest of ours or only been here maybe a couple times, I promise you I am significantly less weird than I sound today. Not totally not weird, but significantly less weird. I just want you to hear that and know that. But here's the thing. I believe Jesus loves you, and everything that I, that I preach to you today I believe is coming. And it's my responsibility to make sure that we're ready for that, that we are ready for what is to come. Amen? One of the ways that we get ready for that is to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And this year at our Burlington campus, we are doing a Thanksgiving outreach the night before Thanksgiving. This is an all-church, all-campus outreach. Last year, we fed about 500 people a Thanksgiving meal. We gave away about 100 food boxes, and we did haircuts and showers and clothing and all kinds of great things for the community. And Jesus says that we are responsible to love the least of these. And so we're going to do this again this year. Inside your bulletin this morning, there's an insert of the things that we're asking for donations for. And we know you might be thinking, Pastor, you want me to pack a shoebox and you want me to bring Thanksgiving food? Yeah, I do. But if you don't want to do either one of those things, we're not tracking you. I don't, you know, the mark is coming late. It's not right now. You got, okay, that's a bad joke. I'm sorry. We're not, we're not worried about that. We just want to give you an opportunity to let Jesus use you in a different way. And you can come and volunteer for that event. So at every campus, make sure that you're aware of that insert inside of your bulletin and make sure that you're paying attention to how God wants to use our church in this holiday season because it is time for us to put our money where our mouth is, to get passionate about people again, and to keep putting people over the progress that we want to make in our own lives. Amen? That we would say we care about people. Amen? That's huge. So. I want to say thank you so much for being here at every campus today. You are closing live with your campus pastor here at Cedra Woolley. I'm going to invite Pastor Johnny to come up and tell us a couple things this morning. Let's hear it for this guy this morning. All right. Well, I, for one, am glad that my hope's in Jesus. Are you guys glad to? Well, I want to just remind you a couple things. Like Josh mentioned, uh, don't forget to grab a shoebox on the way out. Uh, grab two, three, ten, whatever you'd like. Uh, if it's a big deal for you, partner up with somebody and do shoebox together. It's a great time. Uh, shoeboxes will be due in two Sundays, the 19th of November. Uh, and, and you can just bring them right back here, and we'll have a spot for you to bring them. Also, check your bulletin for a list of ways to participate in our Thanksgiving outreach. Uh, and you can ask the info desk if you need to, if you have any other questions. And lastly, uh, if you'll stand with me, let's pray together as we dismiss. Lord, thank you for 
uh, for promising to come again, giving us a hope for a future, God. We know that because we're following you, this isn't scary. This isn't something we need to fear, but it's a blessed hope, God. We thank you for that. We thank you for your son on the cross that he died and rose again for me and for us together, Lord. I pray blessings on each and everyone here as we go out into our workplaces and our homes, Lord. I pray blessings on them in your name. Everyone said Amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys.